and we're set, we set up this speaker event with um, the guys from Unknown Wills. Um, we have three of them actually here with us. We have um, Max, who's a technical director. Hello. Um, Brian, who is lead programmer. Yeah. Programmer. Um, and we also have Hugh, which is um, he's he does a lot of the um, less useful production. Yeah, we, we don't know what he does. Yeah, who <laughs> knows what he does? <laughs> so uh, that's basically. And um, if you guys didn't know, uh, we're the Coders Club, and this is how you get to our a somewhat functional website, mm -hmm. and you can, um, it has a Facebook and everything, so that's where the organization that brought you here, so. Oh, join the Google group, because that's where okay. we have all our conversations. Sorry. Yeah, so, I guess you guys can just, uh, okay. co-founders of Unknown Worlds, and I am the director of technology. We have a lot of titles for a company. We have four programmers, um, so we have a lot of, sounds like we're very top heavy in terms of management, but uh, actually we're not. We're just basically like four, four guys working on the game. Um, I started working on the game in uh, Natural Section 2. How many of you are familiar with uh, Unknown Worlds and Natural Section 2? Um, so I started working on 2006. Um, I moved out here to California. Um, Natural Section 2 is a, um, this is a screenshot from it. It's a first person shooter, real time strategy hybrid. Um, it's actually a sequel to a Half Life mod, uh, which was developed back in around 2000, uh, 2002. And then around 2006, uh, my partner Charlie and I decided that we wanted to make a full blown commercial sequel to it. Um, at that time, it was just the two of us, and it took a long time to build a company and get things off the ground. And uh, yeah, worked on it for about six years. And then we released it in October. Um, and that's all we'll say about that. So I asked Neil uh, what would be good topics to talk about here, uh, not really knowing what the audience would be like. And he suggested uh, a good topic might be what advice would I give to my 17 year old self? Uh, myself when I was uh, in your position uh, in school and then kind of looking forward to the future. Uh, so this is me back in 2001, um, graduating with my gigantic diploma. <laughs> um, at that time, I didn't really think, I wasn't really planning on going to computer games. Um, I didn't really think of it as a real career. Uh, mainly because I didn't, I didn't know anybody working in computer games. Um, it was something I was really interested in, but it just didn't seem like uh, you know, something people actually did for a job. So I got my degree in math, uh, I majored in computer science as well. And as I was starting to apply for jobs, I uh, was applying to all kinds of non-game related jobs. And I started realizing that that seemed really boring, and that maybe I should give this non-real career uh, a try. And actually, I'm not even sure that I'm still not sure that computer games is a real career. It's definitely a real job. You know, there's a lot of work. Day-to-day, it's, -day it's not all that different from, I don't know, if you're working at Microsoft, working on PowerPoint, or something like that. Um, but as a career, a career is something you, know, you, you stay in for a long time and you retire from at some point. And I don't know anybody who just retired uh, from the video game industry. In fact, like, I don't know if this is still true, but a few years ago I saw some report that said that uh, most people only last like two or three years in computer games. Uh, I think part of that's because just traditionally as a uh, very young person's industry, we work a lot of long hours, and there's definitely a lot of ups and downs in, uh, in companies, a lot of layoffs, all that kind of stuff, and I think it uh, tends to spit a lot of people out. Um, so I don't really know anybody that's retired, and I guess we're kind of getting to the point in the video game industry where the agents are getting high enough that that might start happening. But, uh, but yeah, I don't really know what the future is like for me. 
Um, I don't know if I'll be making a few games when I'm 65. I guess we'll see. I'm uh, 34 now, in case you're wondering. I didn't think that was that old until I started thinking about uh, some of the things I wanted to talk about in this presentation. Then it started seeming like, wow, that was a long time ago, 2001. Uh, and this is what I wanted to avoid. This is a still from the movie Brazil. If you haven't seen it, you should definitely see it. Um, but this is kind of what I imagined non-computer games like. Uh, and I, I didn't want to have that kind of job. In fact, when I was graduating, uh, one of the guys that lived next to me in the dorm, I guess he was super proud of this, but he uh, he had gotten a, a job offer from Cisco, and he posted the uh, the letter on his on his door, the door of his dorm room, and it said like, "We're really happy to offer you a position as programmer number three at Cisco." And that was like the job title. It was like the third rank of programmer. It sounded so like dry and uninteresting that I just you know I couldn't imagine myself going into that that type of world. Um, so a lot's changed since I started uh, working in computer games in 2001. Um, there was no Steam in 2001, I would guess most people are familiar with Steam. Certainly if you play PC games, I imagine you would be. Uh, back in 2001, if you were going to buy a game, you would go to game, GameStop, or you would go to Best Buy, or Walmart, or whatever. Uh, now, I don't know what the numbers are, but I would guess the majority of PC games, at least, and um, are going through Steam. And for consoles, I imagine there's a lot of digital uh, sales as well. Um, there was definitely no iPhone. There weren't even really smartphones. Uh, I don't think I knew anybody had a cell phone. Um, so that's definitely a gigantic change. Um, no, no tablet computers. This is also uh, becoming a big factor in the game industry. There weren't any uh, kind of ready-made toolkits for making games. This is uh, Unity, and there's also the Unreal, um, the Unreal Engine. The Unreal Engine existed, for sure. Uh, but in order to use the Unreal Engine, you need to basically have a company, you need to give them a million dollars, and that was pretty uh, accessible for your average uh, person who wanted to start making a game. How many of you are familiar with Unity? Fair number. Um, and actually, what's interesting, I think, is that these are huge factors in the game industry now. Um, you know, people will tell you that lots of uh, lots of games are, are migrating to the handheld devices, like the iPhone and the tablets. Uh, certainly, that's also uh, generating a lot of games made with Unity, which allows you to develop a game and deploy it to you know, Android and iPhone and PC and Mac and web, like wherever you want to. Um, so these are all uh, really big factors in the game industry. And these are actually, you could look at a shorter timeline than when I was entering into the game industry. If you look, look five or six years ago, a lot of these things also didn't exist. I guess the only one really that was a factor was Steam. And it wasn't nearly as, uh, wasn't nearly as significant. So these are the games that were popular. These were kind of the big hits in 2001. Uh, Counter-Strike and Diablo 2 were my personal vices. Um, I just like Halo and Grand Theft Auto 3. And these are the games that are popular last year. <laughs> um, <laughs> Grand Theft Auto 4 is a little bit of a stretch. I think that was two years ago. But, um, so, you know, even though a lot's changed, a lot stays the same, too. Um, man, it's actually, I don't think it's coincidental that you see the same titles here. Uh, one thing that has changed over the last 10 years in the game industry is um, a lot of the kind of smaller Public, uh, smaller developers have basically gone out of business. Um, the company that I went to go work for uh, when I graduated from college, we had about 30 people. And after we took the first game, the company went out of business. Um, it is very difficult to survive in the game industry like that unless you're making a mega hit because games cost a lot of money. So games are still making tons of money outside of those new markets like the iPhone and the tablets and whatnot, but it's only these really mega games. But there are some new things too. Um, so despite that, I'm guessing most of you know all those games. Um, you know, Minecraft kind of redefined what an indie title can do. Uh, one guy made a game, sold 10 million copies on the PC, and I don't know how many on the Xbox, uh, which is, by most measures, that would be huge success even for 
one of those games on the previous slide. And I think that's probably more than Diablo 3 sold. It's probably more than any of those games sold. Uh, except maybe the console ones. Um, you know, the same thing is true for Angry Birds, a much smaller game, but it's, it's kind of redefined uh, how we play games. We play them on the, um, on the train. League of Legends is a totally new thing that wouldn't have even entered into anybody's mind 10 years ago. The idea of a free-to-play game where you can just download the game and play it for free and then you buy tiny little pieces of garbage in the game or whatever you buy. <laughs> um, so those are like big new things that are happening. Indie, mobile, uh, free-to-play. And uh, trends aren't just, they're not just like this. Uh, somewhere between when I graduated and now, um, everything became about MMOs. I guess EverQuest was popular when I graduated, and then World Warcraft came soon, and then it was just this whole avalanche of MMOs. Uh, and it was like, that was the future, MMOs. Uh, but if you look now, most of them are kind of suffering. Or they're having to really um, kind of reinvent themselves. So this was the, the question that was often asked when, uh, when I was graduating. You'd see this all the time on programming forums. Uh, how do I get into the games industry? Which I always thought was kind of a dumb question. Um, always seemed pretty honest to me. You just get off jobs. That's what I did to get into the games industry. Um, so this is the question I see a lot more now. And I think it's because of those trends. Um, you know, those mid-tier mid -tier developers are basically gone. They're these huge, uh, huge teams making the, those mega hits. And you have all this interesting indie and social and mobile stuff going on, uh, which one person can do, one person can make Minecraft. So this is a question I hear, is like, how do I make a game? Uh, which is a more interesting question, but it's not one that I feel qualified to answer, because I am, and I guess I'm a game maker, but I'm definitely more of a technology creator. Um, I'm really interested in making a technology to make games. Not, uh, I like being a part of, of the game making process, but I'm not a game designer. Um, I consider myself a great creator. So this is the question that I am going to talk about. And you know, that's a big question to answer. Uh, so I'm not really going to answer that question. I'm just going to talk about some of the things that over the last 12 years, I guess, that I've been uh, building game engines. I guess I've built two of them in my career. I've only shipped two games over 12 years, which is kind of low, I think. But um, That's average. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I feel like I've learned a few things that I wish I had known when I started. So I'm going to share those with you. Okay. So how many of you are C++ programmers? Okay, not that many. So this is going to be kind of C++ focused, so um, I, hope, I hope it's still interesting uh, to the rest of you. But I guess it applies elsewhere. Um, so this is kind of something you might, if you were going to build a game, something you might create. Um, you have, in the game you have all kinds of objects that you know, might represent like, this table, it might represent the people in the audience, uh, the player, uh, you know, some health thing that you can pick up. There are all these objects in the world. Um, and you need to do various types of processing on them. So these are two kind of basic things. I just tried to come up with something pretty simple. Uh, you might want to render it, you want to basically draw it on the screen. Or you might have some interaction with it where you're gonna you're gonna shoot a ray through the scene and figure out if it hit that thing. So you might be doing that if you uh, have a game in which you can select the objects, you can trace a ray from the camera, see if it hits the object. Um, you might do that if you have a game involved shooting. You're, you're gonna model the trajectory of the bullet as a straight line, so you want to see if that hits hits the object. So in um, kind of traditional object-oriented programming, this is basically what you do. You create some uh, class which is going to represent the game object, and we've added two methods to it. And these are both, they have no, I haven't supplied any implementation for it, but when I make um, some particular type of thing in the world, so this is going to be a player, it's going to be a type of game object, and I am going to provide implementations for those two functions, the render and trace array. And when the implementations aren't really all that interesting, all they do is Kind of pass along the work to somewhere else. Um, and then if I wanted to create, say, uh, the health thing that I was talking about, there would be another class, which would be another type of game object. It would have similar functions. It would provide its own rendering of that object. Um, and you can keep going. In a game, 
you know, natural selection too, I, I don't know how many of these types of things we have, but there's probably hundreds. Uh, if you had, you know, a role-playing game, you might have even more. Um, but there are some problems with this. And, you know, this is kind of like the by the books implementation. If you read a book on how to program C++ and you decided to sit down and write a game engine, you probably would do this, and it would be not a great idea. Um, and this is one. So, as, um, as part of the process now, we need, to, we need to render all those objects on the screen. So this is super simple. We just iterate over all the objects and we call that render method. And there are a number of problems with this, but the most important one right now is that it's not necessarily for, 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 uh, for the performance. Um, we're going to call each object's render method individually. Um, it, we don't know what type, this code doesn't know that it's going to render a player, it doesn't know anything about the object, uh, which means it can't do any higher level optimization. And I'll show you exactly what that is in a second. Um, so this is how I would say that you should structure it instead. So it's not all that different, except we got rid of the render and we got rid of the trace ray methods. So we don't actually, um, we're not actually going to perform those objects, those uh, operations on this object. Instead, this player is going to own these two other things which can perform those uh, operations. So we're going to create uh, the render model, which is going to have all the logic necessary to do the rendering. We're also going to create the collision model. The collision model is going to have the logic necessary for figuring out if the ray hit that thing. And this is kind of what it looks like. So, so in the game, you've got this game world. It represents you know, the, the entire world, basically what you're interacting with and seeing. And all those yellow boxes going vertically are all the different game objects. Um, and with this different way of modeling it, where you're not using the kind of by the book object oriented design, you have these two other things going on. You've got the render scene and the collision scene. And the render scene is kind of similar to the game world, except it only contains the representation that is absolutely necessary for drawing this thing on the screen. And the collision scene only has representation necessary for uh, performing like, ray tracing operations, which you do those kind of things a lot in the game game. Or if you want to figure out like if something is going to fall and if it's going to hit the table, it'll be able to answer those kind of questions. So it just has the bare minimum ne uh, information necessary to do that. And then all on the left, the game objects, they just have references to, to other things. And say that uh, you know our player moves in the world, then we just go to the uh, render model that we have in the render scene, we move that. And we go to the, the collision uh, model that we have in the collision scene, and we move that, and it's all good. The reason why this is useful is because, well, we can rewrite it like this. So this is basically that code I just showed, except I replaced the word um, game world with render scene. So that's not all that different, it's basically exactly the same. Except I can also write it like this. So now I know something about the things that I'm calling render on. So I know here I'm going to be iterating over a bunch of models. And in, in the rendering representation of the world, there might be a couple different types of things. You might have mod models. I've also put particles here. Um, you know, there, there could be a you know, handful of different types of things you're going to render. And there's some kind of common overhead stuff that you need to do before you start rendering it. So I've just put that into these functions. Uh, set up model rendering, set up particle rendering. But basically here, the object-oriented approach, the thing that's initiating the process knows nothing about the innards of the entity, or sorry, the game object, um, which is the, it's kind of the whole point of object-oriented programming. You're creating these abstractions. Like, it doesn't need to know how that works. It can just call the render function, and it knows it's going to show up on the screen. But the problem is you lose performance by not knowing that. Here I can, I can factor out the, the common parts. There's all kinds of things you can do once you have that information. So this is a much better way of setting up your game world. This took me a long time to figure out. That was the first thing. This is the second thing. This is going to be a little more difficult to explain, I think, if you're not a C++ programmer, because it's actually completely irrelevant if you're not programming in C++ or a, game, or a language that you do. Um, you have to do your own memory management. So in C++, you're going to have to allocate memory, and you're going to have to free memory um, whenever you need it. Um, I guess you, if you're using Java or whatever, you have to allocate it, but you don't have to free it. It's out of the garbage collector. 
Um, and the way you do that in C++ is with the malloc function or the new function. These are kind of like the built-in things. It makes built-in operators with the language. It makes it super simple to allocate memory. Um, but the problem is you don't have any way of tracking where that memory is going. And when you are responsible for freeing up the memory, you don't have this handy dandy garbage collector to do it for you, um, it's really easy to kind of mess it up and allocate something and then forget to deallocate it. Then you have a memory leak. And eventually your program uses up all the memory and crashes. So a much better approach is to um, kind of wrap those functions with something else and do all of your allocations through some interface that you define. So this is kind of uh, one way of doing it. You have this class, which is uh, just handles all the allocations. And there's basically two functions, like it's not allocate and free. Oh, there was a mistake there. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's basically the same as calling malloc or free, but you do it through this class. And you have multiple classes like this. this you can instantiate in multiple different ways. You can provide different implementations for alloc and free. Um, there are, if you, if you use new or malloc or whatever, you're using kind of like a general purpose memory allocator, which is uh, generally good, but it's not good for all situations. Maybe you know something about the way that you're allocating and deallocating your memory, like maybe you're always allocating objects of the same size. And you can do that more efficiently if you use a special purpose allocator. Um, so that's what you can do with these classes. It's super, super handy, and we use these in, um, in natural selection too, and it helps you find all those memory leaks if you forgot to deallocate memory, or it allows you to say, how much memory am I actually using right now, which is not a question that you can really answer. Otherwise, even Windows, you can bring up your task manager and it gives you some number that doesn't really represent um, exactly how much memory you're using, but this lets you do it exactly. And all the rest of this junk is to kind of make it very similar to um, using those built in functions. The other thing that's kind of good about using these allocators that I think is good for game programming, uh, maybe not for other types of programming where you're not really performance or memory sensitive, is it actually makes it a little more tedious to allocate memory. So you need to, anytime you want to allocate something, you can't just call a global function, uh, malloc or new, to give you that memory. You need to use, you need to have a, one of these objects which you need to get passed around from one piece of code to the next. Uh, <clears throat> which is a little tedious, but that's good. It kind of makes you think before you go and allocate memory willy-nilly by adding in an extra step. And this is kind of a lot to take in, so if you're interested in this, um, I'd recommend checking out this blog, which will describe this much better than I have. Um, in fact, if you're interested in, um, in game development, I would definitely check out this BitSquid blog. BitSquid is an engine made by um, some guys who used to work at a company called Grin in Sweden. And they developed a new engine and they've tried to do a really good job with it and they detail a lot of what they've done on the blog. And I definitely learned a lot from them. Okay, more C++ details. <coughs> Fascinated. Um, so this kind of goes along with the memory allocation. So in C++, there's kind of a standard library of stuff. <coughs> Appropriately named STD. Because um, once you start using these things, they will kind of infect all of your code. Um, so a vector is a dynamic array. So in a uh, you know, language like Java or, or most other languages, um, C++ is sort of a, a low level language by um, a lot of standards, I guess. Um, which is why it's very popular for game development. Um, you don't really have dynamic vectors. You know, you can either allocate however much memory you're going to need to store all those game objects, and then if you have one more than that, you have a problem, or you need to uh, either implement that functionality yourself, or use one of these things. Uh, so, std vector is an array, std list is a linked list, std map is a, um, it's called an associative array, uh, same thing with hash map, and std string is just for storing character data. And um, if you follow my advice about using the allocators, these things don't kind of work that well because they want to allocate the memory themselves. So they're using malloc or new or whatever under the covers, and you can do some trickery to get it to use your stuff, but uh, it's really not worth it. Um, it's much easier just to kind of write the stuff yourself. 
Um, and I would say most of these things you should not be using in a game anyway. Uh, like you shouldn't, you should never use a linked list in a game. Uh, certainly not that type of linked list. Um, and this STB map, uh, you probably shouldn't be using that either, which I'll talk about in a second. And the same thing goes for strings. If you're if you have all these text strings in your game, uh, you know it's it's probably they probably don't need to be there. And actually, the same is even true for dynamic array. Um, a lot of stuff in games you can put upper bounds on. You could say there's never going to be more than 2,048 objects in the world, which is actually a limit that we have in natural selection too, which we just changed today to uh, go to 4,096 because it wasn't enough. But a lot of this stuff you can kind of statically, you can figure out, okay, this is the upper bound. I'm never going to go above that. Um, and usually that works okay. Okay, so now I want to talk about something which uh, I guess this would be another way of saying everything you're learning is probably wrong. Uh, at, least, <laughs> at least when it comes to games. Um, so this is a this is a binary tree. Um, it's a diagram of a binary tree. So what binary tree? This is a data structure. This is kind of a, a simple example, but I can um, I can relate to something that's actually real in a second. Um, so this is basically a data structure that I'm storing integers in. So those are the numbers that you see there. Those are the numbers that are getting stored in my binary tree. And they are stored in a very particular order where the left side is always less and the right side is always greater. So 89 is greater than 60, 56 is less than 60. Uh, and they all, every circle there, every node in the tree has the same property. This is a really um, classic Data structure. It's pretty useful, but it has some problems. Um, so this is what we might use it for. We want to determine if the number 45 is in this our, our data set here. And the way you do that is so we go to the first, we go to the root node of the tree. If it's less than 45, then we want to continue checking on the left side uh, because we know, you know everything on the right side is going to be greater than 54. So we don't need to examine that. So then we go to the next level, the, the left child of that, and uh, 45 is greater than 26, so that means we need to go down to the right side, and then we get down to the, the end there, and we see, oh, it is equal to 45, so that means it is in, in our data. If we got to the last step and it wasn't, then we would know that it's not there, because uh, we, would have, um, we would have had to satisfy those conditions. So. Um, this is, this algorithm is what you call order login. So that means if we have n nodes, n circles here, and, um, and it's all nicely balanced like this, so if we have kind of equal numbers of children on both sides, then it's going to take on the order of the log of n operations in order to determine if something is in the tree. So there are seven nodes, and the log of seven is Approximately three log base two, um, so we'll have to we'll have to do three steps. That's pretty good. Three steps for seven things. Um, this is what it would look like in code. Not super important, but that's good because if we checked every every thing to see if it was in there, that would take us seven operations, right? So that would be order n. So kind of classic computer science would tell you that. Order n is worse than order log n. Order log n is, is faster. It does less, less tests, which is true, uh, especially if n gets really big. If you have like a million of those circles, then there's going to be a significant difference in how many tests we have to do. But maybe we don't have a million. Um, and <laughs> maybe there are other factors. Maybe just how many tests we do is not the most important thing. So this is what I said, your professors are lying to you. Um, so this is, the, this is the other version. This is the, uh, we search through everything. So instead of storing it in that tree, we just have it in an array. It's very simple, uh, which is actually a nice property. Even though this is order n, the other is order log n, like this is supposedly slower. Uh, it is much simpler. Um, I'm positive there's no bugs in that. Um, I'm pretty positive there's no bugs in the other one. But you know, if we made these algorithms a little more complicated, 
then I would have much less confidence about that. Um, but it turns out, in a lot of cases, this is going to be faster because the number of tests you do is not the most important factor when the computer is executing some piece of code. It was true, you know, 30 years ago, and it was true 10 years ago to some degree, but it started changing. Um, and just the way processors have evolved, they've become very good at executing things. Uh, what hasn't changed that much is how fast it is to access things from memory. So, in this case, we're doing a lot of memory accesses here. So we start at the, the root node, and then here, this little arrow means we have to access the memory at root. Um, and then we're going to say we do this path, the left path. Then we're going to recurse into this function, and now we're going to access the memory for that one. And then we're going to go one more level. We're going to access the memory again. And those memory accesses are really slow. And in order to make them not slow, the CPU has a cache. And the cache stores things that it thinks you're going to need. There are things that you recently accessed in memory. It'll store things that are close to that in memory, because it thinks you might need those as well. Like, actually, it will help us here. Because if you look at the structure at the top, that's what each of those circles is represented by. So that has um, three pieces of data in it. It has the value that we store in the node, and then it has pointers to the left and right child. So on this line right here, we're going to access the first uh, piece of information, about the value. And the CPU is really smart, and it knows pretty soon we might need to access those other things. So it's going to also bring them into the fast cache. Um, so that when we get to here, or here, and we access those, they're already available, so it's not as expensive as it was to access the first piece of data. But the way this thing is going to be laid out in memory very well could be very similar to this diagram. So this guy is nowhere near this guy in memory. So when we pull in the data for this, we're not pulling in any data for this guy. And that means each time we traverse one of those arrows in this diagram, we're going to have a whole new set of data we need to pull in, and we're going to get these cache misses, which can be 10 or 100 times as expensive as just doing some simple operations. So it turns out this is probably, in most situations, certainly a lot of uh, video game situations where the you know, number of elements in this array is not going to be too big. You're not going to have you know, the entire Google database that you're searching through to answer somebody's um, search query. Um, and it might be a lot faster to just do it like this, because this is going to go just sequentially through memory. It's going to be really good for the cache. Um, there's also all kinds of other stuff you can do with this particular um, uh, layout, which is hard with the kind of tree structure. You can make this run on multiple CPUs really easily. You can take advantage of the fact that the CPU is capable of doing four things at once. Um, there's other things too, and these are all kind of details, but the CPU also, um, it's going to have to test this condition every time through uh, whether or not element is equal to value. And like most of the time we go through, that's going to be false because we're searching for one specific thing. So most of the time we go through this array, uh, or every time we do a loop, it's going to be uh, the answer to that's going to be no. And that's actually really good for the CPU. This is another factor that you have to take into account is um, if the CPU is doing the same thing every time, it can kind of predict, okay. I expect I'm going to need to um, I'm going to need to do another iteration of this loop, and it can potentially uh, start predicting those instructions before it has actually <coughs> finished this test. Excuse me. So this is the situation with writing uh, high performance code: is a lot of the algorithmic stuff, like use correct data structures becomes a lot less important than some of these details. Like, write your code so that's really good for the CPU that it's actually executing on. Uh, unfortunately, this, a lot of stuff is not, you know, you won't learn this in school. Um, there are some books you can learn from, but some of it you just need to get some experience. <clears throat> and a lot of it's pretty much black magic. Um, you know, I couldn't tell you what number of elements in the array is going to make the difference. Where, where do I want to use the binary tree? Where do I want to use the array version? Um, I don't know. So the best way to do it is to just profile it. You do it both ways, see which is faster. Um, that's not always so easy because when you're developing a game, when you start, there's nothing. Um, so you don't know 
you know, two years down the road, is it going to be better for that to have been an array, or should that have been a binary? You don't know. But what you can potentially do is try to create some sort of benchmark. So you don't know how many, um, you, you don't have the exact game objects that are going to be in the world. But maybe you can figure, you know, there's going to be 2,000 game objects. So if I go through this loop and I call render on all of them, that's going to be an issue um, because of virtual tables and, and whatnot. And I can't match the models all together and render them or the particles all together. But you don't have the final data, but maybe you can set up some sort of benchmark. You can say, OK, I'm going to have 500 models. I'm going to have 200 particle effects. And you can just try to get a best guess with uh, some sort of artificial benchmark. This is something I've never actually done, but it seems like a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because at some point an artist, if you're making a game engine, an artist will ask you how many polygons should be in this model, which is basically an impossible question to answer as far as I can tell. But if you wanted to try and get close to an answer, you could make you know, a model with 10,000 polygons and put a whole bunch of them in the world and see, okay, is that a performance problem or is that okay? Um, and that's basically the only way you can get the answer to these questions, as far as I know. Um, so this is kind of a lot of details, and I certainly would want to put anybody off from actually like just making something, um, because you feel like you need to know all these details. They become important when you're working on a large project. Um, you know, our game has lots of stuff going on in it. It's, becomes important what the exact uh, performance characteristics are. <coughs> if you're making, you know, a really simple game, um, you know, this stuff probably doesn't matter at all. You should do it the by the book C plus plus way. It'll be nice and straightforward. And I would also say that like uh, ninety nine percent of professional game development is done in C plus plus or uh, C plus plus and then maybe some other languages. But uh, I know there's like a Java program here, and so I imagine some of you are Java programmers. And you know, a few years ago, I probably would have told you that you can't make a game in Java, but Minecraft is written in Java, and clearly that has worked out okay. Um, so <clears throat> this is a this is a quote from E. B. White, the famous computer scientist, seen writing a program there <laughs> with his pal Sparky, um, which I think is a pretty good quote. Um, you basically, you know, you, you can't wait for things to be perfect. Uh, <clears throat> you can't wait till you have the perfect design or all the knowledge, you need to just start doing it. Uh, this is something I actually often find when I'm programming, and I, I feel like I have some sort of like, writer's block, I guess, uh, is I, I'm trying to create the perfect solution. I want to you know, make sure I've got my thing optimized for cache or minimize memory allocations or whatever. And sometimes that just is, uh, it becomes an impediment, you just need to just do it, um, and you can always fix it up later. Unlike E.B. White, there was typewriter. And we learned a lot. That's my email and my Twitter. Because we are in a new millennium here. Uh, so if you want to contact me, that is that. And if you have any questions, I guess maybe you want to talk to and we can do questions after. Uh, I don't know. Whatever you want. That sounds good. Okay. Because then we can just talk about whatever. Okay.